Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this monitor here. This is a Samsung data display, model number CD1452M. This is a computer display monitor from the 1980s, and unlike what it probably looks like to you, this is not just a normal CGA style monitor, which I don't blame you for thinking, because honestly, most of the monitors that you find from that time period that look like this are just normal CGA monitors. Starting on the front panel top corner here, we can see the little badge that's on here. And I think this monitor was probably OEM for a bunch of other companies. So if you've seen one that looks similar to this, but has a different label here, then yeah, that's probably why. Samsung in the 80s, at least in North America, wasn't really a big deal when it came to its own brand. And very often they actually made monitors for lots of other manufacturers, including Apple. Inside this little front panel here, we have a switch that probably enables green text, I would imagine. And then we have contrast and a brightness control. And this little door does actually latch. There's a little thing there just to help you open it. There you go, like that. And blow the trap door. We have a push on, push off power switch with a non-standard icon for the power switch. I don't know when it was standardized that the circle with a line through it was the standard for power, but this was not using it. The CRT that's used here has an etched glass on it, so it's anti-glare. Doesn't seem to have any visible burn in, maybe, maybe ever so slight amount in this area up here. It's hard to tell though. This poor monitor's obviously been through some rough handling because there's definitely some scuffs and scratches along the bottom edge here, along the top edge. There were actually a lot of black marks on it as well, which I have actually since cleaned off. I used some baking soda on a cloth that does a pretty good job at removing marks from the plastic without actually taking off a lot of the texture of the plastic, which can be a problem if you use, say, Magic Eraser and you rub too hard on it. Rotating the monitor around, the side is, well, nondescript. This thing doesn't have any built-in speakers or anything like that, so we just have a plastic grill. The other side of the monitor looks basically exactly the same. Obviously, we have some case yellowing going on. This shouldn't be this color. I'm sure it would have light gray when this was originally made. This monitor does scream cheapness a little bit when it comes to the fixed power cord. It's non-removable and the video cable as well is non-removable. On our label on the back, there's that model number again, color display unit in color, 160 volts, 60 hertz, 1.4 amps. We have a serial number that someone wrote again with a marker and April 1987 as the manufacturing date. The back panel has four controls, H size one and H size two. Interesting, isn't it? And then it has two controls that are recessed inside. I guess we'll find out what these are once we open it up. And looking at the video cable, which is attached, you can see that this is nine pins, which basically screams that this is a TTL video display, AKA CGA. But the fact this has two horizontal size controls and yet is TTL, that implies that this is actually an EGA monitor. And what's really cool about that is EGA monitors are not super common. EGA, unlike CGA monitors, are multi-scan monitors. That's because the CGA resolution that EGA monitors support is just standard NTSC style timings. 15.7 kilohertz, 60 hertz refresh rate, essentially 640 by 200 lines, or you could do interlaced, so 400 lines or 480 lines, depending if you have a border or not. But IBM introduced EGA with their IBM 5154 monitor and the EGA video adapter, which which added additional modes that were higher resolution versus CGA. You had 640 by 350 lines running also at 60 Hertz and the additional lines over CGA yielded much sharper text when viewed in 80 columns. And a lot of EGA cards actually render text in 720 by 350 lines instead of just 640 by 350, which is what the graphics mode is. And of course on something like a CRT, the number of horizontal pixels you are displaying is completely arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. It could be any number. So 720 or 640 or 320 or even 2000 across doesn't really matter as long as the horizontal scan rate and the vertical scan rate doesn't change because those are the things that are fixed inside the monitor. Well, this being a dual scan monitor, it actually supports both of those modes, the 15.7 kilohertz mode of CGA and whatever EGA is, which I think off the top of my head is something like 22 kilohertz. Now you might look at a VGA monitor like this Sony Multiscan 15SF2 and think, hey, this is multi-scan monitor as well. And yes, that is absolutely true. Later VGA monitors were multi-scan and specifically they support multiple scan rates for all the higher resolution or the super VGA modes that VGA or SVGA and XGA and all those other things support. What this monitor and like 99.9% .9 of VGA CRTs do not support 
are any scan rates below 31.5 kilohertz, which is the normal minimum scan rate that VGA runs at. That means if you try to feed in a 15 kilohertz scan rate into this or even the EGA 22 kilohertz, absolutely will not work and this monitor won't sync to it. Now this one has on-screen display, so it'll say, you know, sync out of range or whatever. But if you try to hook it up to an older VGA monitor that's analog, you'll just get a really messed up picture. I might be wrong about this, but the IBM EGA adapter and the Matchy monitor that came out in 1984 when the IBM PC5170 was released, I think was the first commercially produced multi-scan monitor that could actually support multiple scan rates. If we think back on the lineage of CRT displays, really they were designed as televisions at first. And of course that meant that it was only really supporting one type of video signal running at one scan rate. So all of the circuits inside here were tuned exactly for that particular scan rate to operate as efficiently as possible. When you try to operate a monitor outside of its designed scan rate, it starts to really struggle and you might not have sufficient high voltage or other issues can happen. There are a whole bunch of tuned circuits in there that have resonances and oscillations and whatnot. And when you run outside of its designed range, yeah, you have issues. But with a multi-scan monitor, it has to be able to support multiple frequencies that aren't necessarily super close together. And with an EGA monitor, there's obviously some switching that goes on inside to support the double scan rates that this thing could do. And even the first VGA monitors that came out, I'm pretty sure only ran at 31.5 kilohertz or thereabouts for its horizontal refresh rate. Therefore, they didn't really need to be as sophisticated as EGA monitor supporting two different horizontal scan rates. Once VGA did come out though, there were true multi-sync monitors that were released that supported all of the EGA, CGA, monochrome, and VGA resolutions. They were very expensive and they didn't really last that long because it wasn't very long before EGA, CGA, and MDA went by the wayside and 100% of people were just using VGA. And I think that's why monitors really standardized on that minimum 31.5 kilohertz as their refresh rate. And then they would support higher ones for support of all the Super VGA resolutions that were starting to come down the pipe. This made it hard for Commodore Amiga owners though, because even the Amiga 1200 and the Amiga 4000, which were released in the 90s, they were still outputting a 15 kilohertz video signal, which is much more like CGA when it comes to its scan rates. Therefore, all these nice high resolution VGA monitors that existed would not work with the Amiga unless you purchased a scan doubler or something like a flicker fixer, which would take the 15 kilohertz video signal and double it to 31 kilohertz, allowing VGA monitors to then be compatible. But then you had issues because you were now outputting a progressive video signal. And anytime you had an interlaced Amiga video signal, you got these combed lines and stuff like that. I had an Amiga 2000 in the early 90s and I used it with a VGA monitor and I had one of those flicker fixer cards in there as actually a combo or one that they made and it allowed me to well not have to buy something like a Commodore 1084 and get really sharp displays which you would typically get on VGA monitors. Now when it comes to monitors like this I don't think a lot of these EGA monitors got that much use because we have to remember EGA was first released in 1984 and this monitor came out in 1987 when VGA was just hitting the scene and very quickly people started migrating to VGA because it really was superior to EGA. So EGA just had that really short run of just a handful of years where these monitors were useful. Now, a multi-sync monitor that supported analog VGA would have been useful. You could have migrated your video card and kept using the monitor. But really, these things just were used for a few years, I think, and then put aside. Someone bought this monitor in 1987, and I can't imagine they used it for very long before they bought a VGA monitor. So hopefully that means that this thing is going to have low hours and have a nice, strong picture. So what I want to do in this video, and I've sort of talked quite a bit for the intro here, is I want to open this thing up because all I've done is briefly turn this on. And you do get a raster, so I know it's working to that extent, but I haven't plugged it into a computer. I don't know if there's reefers inside of here, and I don't, just don't know what it looks like. So I want to open this up, and if everything looks good, I'd like to grab an EGA card and put this monitor through its paces. Now, when it comes to opening up CRTs, only do it if you know how to be safe. So there are dangerous voltages inside of here, especially when it's plugged into mains. These are lethal voltages, especially in 220 volt countries. So please be very careful and do not do it if you are unsure of how to be safe. As for opening this thing, there were two screws on the sides. I'm assuming we're gonna have a few on the bottom. So I might have to flip this up on its face. To prevent scratches, I put a mouse pad down on the table. Don't wanna cause any more damage to this poor old monitor. We can definitely see what color the plastic was originally on the bottom here. It's just sort of a kind of a beigey cream color. So we have two screws on the bottom, no tilt stand of any kind. And I don't see any kind of evidence that there, there was a tilt stand. 
Also noticing that there aren't even rubber feet on this thing. So maybe there was a tilt stand. Someone took it off, I don't know. I did a little bit of Googling trying to find information on this monitor and I really found basically nothing. You can find mentions of the part number or the model number. And I think I looked up the FCC ID. So I, I know for sure that it's a EGA monitor. Of course, I know from the, the controls on the back as well, but I couldn't really even find pictures of this thing. And it just sort of doesn't exist. And it's not like there's a manual or anything like that that I can refer to. So part of the problem with these fixed cables is that you have to feed them through the back. And that means that it's just annoying. So I have to clear my little camera mount here. All right, there's the inside of the case. Got a little bit of a uh, soot up here. So obviously there are some hours on this particular set. Right off the bat, we have some shielding on the bottom here, which makes it harder to work on. A pretty complex looking board over on this side. And we can see here, this is the beefy power supply that might have reefers in here. So I definitely need to open this up and take a look. We have the voltage doubler up here. So it looks like there's a flyback down here, which generates 8,000 volts. And then this thing is a tripler, which goes to 25,000 volts. And then that actually makes its way over to the high voltage anode cap. Plus it generates the focus voltage, which is that wire right there. And we have two controls on the tripler here for focus and screen or grid control. And that's also goes over to the CRT here. Looking at the topology of the monitor, this board over on the side here is used entirely for decoding the digital video signal and converting it into an analog signal. Now, one of the things I didn't mention about EGA is one of the other things that IBM added is to the high resolution mode, it supports up to 64 colors. So instead of on the digital jack here, just a single intensity bit and then the RGB signals, it actually has RGB and then it has three intensity bit. So when you combine those all together, you actually get a total of 64 colors. And this section on the board over here, these digital chips here are gonna be taking those digital signals and then using some resistors to act as a simple DAC or digital analog converter to make some analog video signals that then goes through these potentiometers here. You can have one for RGB, and then that makes its way through these larger transistors here and all this stuff. And this actually is the cathode drive. So there's three wires here, and these are coax cables that go to the neck board, and that carries the actual video signal directly to the neck board. The board on the bottom down there is used entirely for driving the electron beam and the deflection yoke. So it's in charge of the sink and the high voltage and all that kind of stuff. But this board over here is doing video and to eliminate all the possibilities of reducing your image quality, it doesn't run the signals back to the main board and then through some different wires. It runs them with as much quality as possible directly to the neck board. Now with later VGA monitors, like probably that Sony monitor I showed earlier, this entire circuitry, and of course it's VGA, it's not digital, but the entire circuitry that does cathode drive is on the neck board itself. And that eliminates this coax cable situation, which is even more room for loss. And by putting it as close as possible to the CRT, you get the highest possible sharpness when it comes to the video image. Now, again, looking at this board here, you can see these three potentiometers are almost certainly for red, green, and blue, probably signal level coming from the DAC circuitry. And then you have two missing potentiometers here, but then you have two there and two there. And I have a feeling that's gonna be something to do with the bias controls, probably for only two of the electron beams. And the third one typically doesn't have adjustments. And that's because you have to reference the other two off that, the first one there. Looks like there's actually space on the board for those potentiometers though. They just decided to use a fixed resistor value instead of potentiometers. Now, what I'm finding really annoying about this monitor is that none of the controls are labeled. All the potentiometers here are visible and it just says VR713, VR719. It doesn't say what it is. All they had to do was put like green bias, green drive and red bias, red drive, etc., And they didn't. So nothing is labeled in any kind of useful way. Oh, okay. Well, there is something. It says R out, so red, G out for green, and B out for blue. So this entire section of the board right here is going to be for blue, green, and red. That means if we have a color problem with one of those particular electron beams, then we know to focus on the particular area right here on the board. It's also something really weird about this monitor. Hopefully it's in focus. See my little tool there? It's on a little green wire that looks like it's been cut. Now, this is the ground strap for the CRT, and normally this would be grounded to something, but... It was definitely soldered onto the CRT and then it was never attached to anything. It was just cut off. And over here on this side, there's another one of these. It's just weird how it's cut there. And also kind of weird how the wires here are just a bit of a mess. Part of me just wonders, has someone been inside this monitor? Because this just doesn't seem like they would have made the monitor and left it like this. There would have been some kind of wire management going on. And this is indicative of someone having worked on this. Oh, in fact, check this out. Look at this wire here. 
it's wrapped around this plastic standoff super tight. So I feel like someone has worked on this and they did this when they put it back in. I'm just gonna loosen the screws on here, try to pull this away a little bit, just enough to get this wire off there. <laughs> like, I mean, it's possible it was like that since this was manufactured, but I find that really, really difficult to believe. So maybe someone had this apart to try to clean these pots and that's why all these wires are like this. I'm also noticing that the picture tube is made by Toshiba. That's unusual. I'm positive that Samsung was making their own CRTs at this point, although maybe they were too low resolution and they, they used the Toshiba one to get the higher dot pitch or lower dot pitch, whatever, higher resolution. In case you're wondering if I think that this CRT was ever replaced, I'm gonna say no. And that's because there are wedges here all around the deflection yoke and these are glued in. And that glue looks like it was done a long time ago and at the factory. So I don't think this thing has ever been replaced. They just, they just used a Toshiba tube and a Samsung monitor. Okay, enough chit chat. I'm gonna to try to open this power supply up. I just wanna see if there's reefers in here. It's, I don't think it's likely 1987, although, well, I've had Apple II GSs that had reefers in there and those are from a similar time period. So we just need to make sure. I just don't wanna have that horrible, nasty surprise of a reefer going off in my house. All right, there it is. Okay, so this goes to the front to the power switch and I'm assuming the degaussing coil, yep. And we can unplug those and they have a unique number of pins as well. So we won't make a mistake plugging them back in. There it is, the whole power supply is free, it's free. Okay, I think I have all the screws off, sort of. Okay, we, we're getting mooned, we're seeing the backside. Kind of interesting design, has a little piece of plastic here to push on the board right where the transformer is. I think it just gives a bit more strength to the board if this monitor's dropped or whatever. Probably, so I've probably removed 20 screws, but we're not done yet because the PCB is screwed into the here. So we got to take these off next. I can see there's also a plastic thing on the top here that pushes down on the transformer for the same reason to give it that extra structural rigidity. And I can see that there is a reefa in here. So all this work was, was worth it. Yep, take a look at that. There's the power supply. Whoa, that just fell over. Take, we got two reefas right there. X2 caps, we gotta change those out. We have a replaceable fuse. That's nice, it's not just soldered down. We have caps. Do we have that horrible glue? Yes, it's got that conductive glue on here, or it's not conductive, it turns conductive. So what you need to do, uh, let's see if I can try to demonstrate this. Between those caps, you can see some of it down there. If it's touching any of the components, like a resistor or whatnot, then it can cause, uh, well, them to fall off <laughs> and, and other issues. So it's really good if you see some of that on a board, you have to give it a once over. Just look to see it and make sure that none of it's touching any legs of any other components. And if you do see it, you gotta scrape it off. But so far so good, I don't see any issues with it touching anything. There's a single adjustable potentiometer here for the B plus adjustment. Don't touch that. I don't have the service manual for this, so I can't even look up to see what this should be. And when servicing something like this, it's a good idea for me to A, check the capacitors here. Don't need to do the high voltage ones, but the low voltage side down here. Check to make sure that they're looking okay. I can do that in a circuit. Fix the reefas and then go over the back side of the board here and check for any bad or cracked solder joints. I don't think that's gonna be the case. There's a ton of flux on here but it never hurts, especially around the larger components and things like connectors and stuff like that. Okay, the reefas are replaced, 0.1 microfarad, and I checked these capacitors here on the low voltage side, and they're excellent. No, no issues, whatever, low ESR, exactly the right value that they should be. Yeah, I guess they're just good quality. Not like the stuff that came out in the 90s and beyond, turned to junk, but 80s, stuff was still okay. There are no other electrolytics on this entire thing. Oh wait, there's a few over here. And you know what? I'm gonna check those because they're really close to this power resistor here. This has to do with the bootstrap circuit for the controller there. I'm just gonna check these. I, one of them is even touching that resistor. That's terrible, that's absolutely terrible. All right, let me uh, quickly check those. 10 microfarad, 35 volts, nine microfarads, but 2.5 ohms. Here's a brand new 50 volt cap. 33 microfarads and at one kilohertz, we get 1.42 ohms. So I'm not sure that it's actually that bad, the one that's on there. The next one is 47 at 35 and yep, 0.5 ohms. 
and uh, 43 microfarads. So that's that one's good, even though it's very close to this resistor here. But the last one, which this one was, was this one microfarad, I think. It's really hard to read, unfortunately. One microfarad at 50 volts. Yeah, 970 nanofarads, but it's 48 ohms. I don't know, that seems really high. It's a 50 volt cap, but I don't think that's particularly good. I think I'm gonna switch that one out because it was touching the resistor. Okay, the one I just took out, this one is one microfarad. See what it measures out here, 105, wait, yeah, 12 ohms, 960 nanofarads, and that's at one kilohertz. And the one I just installed was brand new. Mm, weirdly enough, it says 27 microfarad. Wait, am I on the wrong one? Yeah, I did. The one I wanted to install is sitting on here on the bench. Good thing I checked because I think the one I put in the board here, it doesn't have the right voltage rating. <laughs> that would have been a, a bit of a disaster. Oh, it does have the right voltage rating, 50 volts, but it's 33 microfarads, <laughs> too big. So the one I wanna put in there is this one, one microfarad at 50 volts. And I'm gonna do the opposite of what they did when they built it. I'm gonna lean the cap away from that resistor. And the thing is the power cord is towards the bottom. So the heat from the resistor is gonna go up. So should stay away from these capacitors, probably why these two survived, but the one that was touching the resistor did not. So yeah, it's gonna lean over like that now. Okay, the new cap, we're getting 1142 nanofarads, one kilohertz and 28 ohms. So when it was, I measured it before I put it in and it was much lower. So obviously something that this is paralleled with, maybe this coil here causes it to read artificially high there, or there's a additional resistance. So actually that kind of tells me that this cap I took out was probably fine. I mean, like I said, this monitor turned on. What is this reading here? Let's try again. Come on meter, what are you doing? Let's try it with the clip leads here, see if we can get an actual reading off this. All right, there we go. Yeah, 12 ohms. You know, I think the one that I've just put in the board when I measured it out of circuit, it was like 10 ohms. So yep, this one was actually fine. So I really didn't need to change it, but whatever. It's a Nietzsche con that I put in there. So hopefully it'll last as long as the rest of the caps that are on this board. All right, at this point, I just need to put this jigsaw puzzle back together doesn't seem particularly interesting. I suppose while I have this out, I should probably try to lubricate these pots here for the front controls. So I'm gonna use QD Electric Cleaner here. Just shoot this in. Let's open the little door first. I'm gonna first get the little button here. Well, I was gonna shoot it in there, but it's actually really difficult to turn the middle knob and I can't get a good view of it. So I'm gonna pull this little board out of here and then we will get that middle knob freed up and it's the right time to do this right now while the power supply is removed, since you can actually access this. Yep, so this one here, oh, it does turn. It's just very, very stiff. So I'm gonna shoot this stuff inside of here. Uh, well, first this one has a little opening here, so that's perfect. So that can go in there. And we just turn it till it turns nice and smooth. It's getting there, it's getting there. Make sure you wear eye protection when you use this stuff. It kind of shoots all over the place. All right, this pot, certainly a different construction. Looks like I can shoot it in over here. Oh yeah, now it turns much more freely. It was very gummed up. Just want to flush out whatever was gummed up in there. Yeah, I couldn't believe how stiff it was. Now it's really turns very easily. The bottom one probably could use a little bit more cleaning though. Can also get some of the stuff in here on this side. Oh, that was going everywhere there. Nice, okay, and the switch here. Is there anywhere to Get some cleaner in there. I don't know, I'm just gonna leave it. It's probably okay. I think brightness and contrast are pretty important knobs to have working, but the green switch, if it's scratchy, who cares? Now, while the power supply is out, maybe there's a good opportunity for me to try to clean these pots because I have access. I think the power supply kind of blocks it normally. So I'm gonna do the same on these.
Oh yeah, wow. It was really gummed up and now that, that one turns very freely. Let's give it another little clean. Now, if you're wondering where to get this stuff, I got it at the auto parts store, QD Electric Cleaner. Pretty inexpensive for this big bottle, lasts a very long time, although a lot of it sprays out when you sh spray it, so it's a bit wasteful in that regard. But yeah, these both turn very, very nicely now. And while the board's out, actually, I'm gonna take advantage of my opportunity to see if there's anything here that needs addressing. Everything looks okay. There's a variable uh, control right there of some kind. I see some resistors, but nothing looks kind of out of the ordinary here. On the deflection yoke here, there's this adjustment here. Maybe it has to do with the width or something. It looks like there's maybe another one on the bottom here. So you can stick a plastic tool in there to potentially change some kind of a oscillation, maybe. Yeah, probably width or something. But it could be related to convergence, dynamic convergence, maybe. Not 100% sure. I'm not going to touch that unless I need to. And the last thing I think I'm going to do while I have the power supply out so I'm just gonna clean up this stuff here, the high voltage tripler here. I just wanna wipe off any excess dust and stuff that's on here. And that's really because it can cause arcing and things like that. And I just, I don't know, I'd rather keep this stuff clean if possible. Fortunately, if this tripler goes bad, pretty much is the end of this monitor. There's nothing you can really do. It's kind of like the flyback when it fails as well. You're pretty much out of luck. On this, the flyback's only 8,000 volts, so it's probably less likely to fail than the tripler. This is what really has the high voltage inside of it, and, and that potential energy that's there with the high voltage is what can cause the breakdown inside. And you have some of this glue or potting here fails. You know, that can cause issues as well. Looks like there's a part number under there, so I could look at that if I needed to. Got some silicone on here of some kind. I know you can't really see it, but it is there. You know what, I probably should have turned this monitor on first. <laughs> Just kind of tried to get an idea of how well it works. <laughs> and of course I didn't. So yeah, anyhow, I guess I'm keeping my fingers crossed that everything works well with this thing and it's not worn out and burned in. Okay, time to put this power supply back together. All right, this thing is back together. Assembly is just reverse of the disassembly. Lots of screws, just pay attention to wire routing. Make sure you don't pinch wires like the previous person who took this thing apart, obviously. I actually put some zip ties on these cables here so they're not all just flopping around in the breeze anymore. I think we're really ready to go for testing this thing out. Two reefas have been replaced and this one capacitor, which I don't think needed to be replaced, was replaced as well. But I also lubricated all of the potentiometers on the front and the back, so that's a good thing. All right, the power switch is off. The mains plug is in the wall. And here we go. I heard the degaussing. I hear high voltage. We have a pilot light there, the little green LED. There we go, getting raster. Now, unfortunately, you're gonna be looking at a rolling image. Let me just give this screen a little clean here. I think there's a little bit of burn-in on this CRT actually, and it's not words and letters that are burned in but it seems like just the active area where the screen is used is actually dimmer. So let's see, brightness and contrast, that's working well, that one's brightness. Contrast doesn't do anything right now, but I bet you contrast only affects the intensity bit coming in over the digital connection. Now I have a little test device, which we're gonna be using today to test this thing out, instead of a computer that is. This thing by CMN is the Computer Monitor Maintenance Device. It outputs CGA, EGA, and a whole bunch of VGA and Super VGA resolutions, and also Sync on Green. So it's obviously useful for digital stuff and testing monitors to see if they have Sync on Green. It's got a 15-pin output VGA and a 9-pin. The whole case is kind of plasticky and falling apart, so hopefully it works today. It's temperamental, 9-volt power supply. Okay, so we're looking at CGA here, and let's see about the contrast knob. Uh, that's brightness on the bottom. Contrast is this top one, and it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Interesting. And I'm quite sure, even though this controls on here are pretty finicky, we should be seeing more colors than this, like brown. And I am not seeing that. That should be the contrast knob 
that changes whether we see brown or not. Also, the monitor's turned up all the way there, and it's not particularly bright. Not at all. Yeah, contrast just does nothing, though. Let's switch over to EGA mode. So you saw it rescan there. And let's see if the contrast knob does anything here. No, it doesn't either. So I'm going to say this monitor has some kind of a fault. Not to mention, it's not very bright. Looks sharp. I can see scan lines even here on EGA mode. And CGA mode, well, let's set the uh, size control on the back here. Well, I clean that potentiometer, but certainly doesn't seem like it's uh, working very well. And on EGA mode, the other control actually does something. So geometry-wise, it seems okay. I'd say the image would be nice to be a little wider. It might be that control on the top, on the top of the deflection yoke I talked about to widen the image. There are also some controls on the side here on the PCB that were labeled and they were horizontal frequency one and two, so EGA and VGA, and then also horizontal phase one and two, so centering. But adjusting those controls on the side obviously have nothing to do with the width, and maybe those little potentiometer things on the back, the ones through the holes, have to do with the width. Why don't I get a little tool here and try to twiddle those? Okay, well, look at that. The first one, <laughs> obviously, uh, this has something to do with the contrast, I guess which is the top knob, right? No. That's really weird. So if I turn this control up all the way, these are the ones that are recessed. We get the yellow. We turn it down. I guess we get brown. I need to hook a computer up, really, to output all 16 colors to see what's actually going on here. But the contrast knob here still does absolutely nothing. And let's twiddle the other control. Ah, this seems to just control the overall I don't think it's contrast. No, that still does nothing, but it seems to be brightness. So that's as bright as it gets now. It's pretty dim. And if I turn this up all the way, now the brightness control, it's a bit brighter. It's still not great, but it's still not terrible either. Just in case you're curious, this thing definitely does not support anything above, anything above EGA. So there's VGA and yeah, we just get um, it not working. We are currently set to 640 by 350, so 31 kilohertz. This monitor does not support. And we are looking at 720 by 400 there. And this is 640 by 480, and that doesn't work. And that's 640 by 480. So yeah, clearly it can't synchronize to these. It, uh, I figured out the contrast control. So there's the button that switches between green and not green. It's a little bit scratchy because I didn't really clean it. But watch this with the contrast knob. If I pull it out, now I can actually turn it. And obviously it's the same as adjusting that potentiometer on the back. There must be like a fixed setting and that's what that control on the back is when you push this in. And when you pull it out, it actually lets you fine tune it. So now we're getting yellow and we turn this all the way down and we get red. And I have a feeling if we were displaying proper 16 colors from a computer, it would also adjust the intensity of some of the, the colors. Let me grab a computer and we can see that operating. All right, I have the 286 here on the bench with a EGA card and it's set for EGA mode. So it's the 350 line mode. Let's turn this on. Ah, okay, that's interesting. So we saw it synchronizing without issue to the box, but I bet you I need to fiddle with one of these controls on the side here. So I'm gonna adjust H, freak, H frequency two. Okay, well, it's definitely having an effect, yep. There it is. It, uh, this is like horizontal hold, if you can imagine. The pot's a little scratchy. I think I'm gonna turn off the monitor here and spray some of this contact cleaner on it. All right, let's see if that made a difference. Oh, I can hear it's way out of frequency right now. Out of, there it is. Um, yeah, I guess it's a little bit less scratchy, hmm, whatever. All right, I have the vid test program on here. And we can adjust, I think, the position as well. H phase, is this one VGA phase? Yes, it is, okay. Yeah, that's normal. It's kind of uh, looping around over here. Now, this is currently in EGA mode. Why? That's why it's purple. Let's go back and go to CGA. And I think if we go to crosshatch, yeah, now we're in CGA 200 line mode, which means I can adjust these other controls here. 
Yep, this one here is the frequency for our CGA, and then phase will be H phase one here. And, um, oh, that's as far over as I can go, interesting. Now remember and keep in mind that these old monitors weren't really designed for edge to edge uh, image, like you got on later VGA monitors where you could get it all the way up to the edges. And the geometry of these monitors was just never that good. So things just kind of aren't perfect on these. And that's how they were when they were new. Now, if we go back to EGA mode here in the purple menu, there's actually a mode switch option too. And this will switch between the two modes. So that's 350 lines and that's the 200 line mode there. So this helps you get everything sized about the same. Looks like the 200 line mode is definitely bigger than the other. Yeah, that looks pretty close as it is right there. And you notice as it's switching between the modes, there is no change in the refresh rate at all. The camera is perfectly locked at 60 frames per second. It's really just the horizontal scan rate that's changing that allows it to have more lines. I have to say, I would like to have an, some additional width on here. So I'm gonna try adjusting this coil that's sitting on top of the CRT here. It's kind of hard because this tool is a bit too long to do it. Okay, I got a shorter tool in here. Let's see, is this adjust the width? What does this adjust? I am honestly noticing no difference as I turn this. Now let's go back to EGA mode. I want to show off the 64 color mode and this program can actually do it. So normally if we go to color bars, this is the normal 16 colors you're used to seeing on CGA, right? This is just RGB with the intensity bit set. So these are the brighter colors. And then we have the brown color, which is basically the yellow darkened with a bit of red added in. That's an IBM modification. So you don't just get a dimmer version of this, you get the brown color. And with the contrast knob, if we pull it out, then I can turn off the intensity altogether. And you can see the yellow is now so dim that the red that's being mixed in to give it that brown color is all you actually see. And if we turn this up, yeah, there you go. Now the green button does work. You can see that we have multiple shades of green. Not sure why anyone would ever actually use that. But if we go to RGB eye pattern here, there are colors here that you normally would never see. We have three shades of each of the RGB, and there are more colors than this, because remember I told you there were 64. We're only actually looking at 16 colors here. I don't know that it's even 16, it's a little bit less than that, but it's actually a palette you can pick from and you can get other shades as well, and you just have to have a program that supports it. Now, unfortunately, the monitors, well, most monitors will only decode these colors in the 350 line mode. So that's the 640 by 350 line modes. The lower resolutions used for games are stuck at the regular 16 colors CGA uses. Now I'm gonna adjust one of the potentiometers on the decoder board here, the top one that's on the R channel. It's the only one that's there. I just wanna see what that actually does. I assume it's like red drive. Yeah, it's like the red drive. So see the red is going away now. The white's looking kind of, uh, kind of like cyan there. But if we add the red back in, you don't want to add too much because then the grays start to come kind of like a reddish color. You just want them to kind of look neutral, but you want to have plenty of red vibrancy available to you. Now, one thing I'm noticing here is that I don't have to turn the brightness all the way up to get it to look okay. But one of the things I am noticing is that the bright colors are almost too bright versus the dim colors. And we can see that again, if we go to color bars, I feel that these should be actually a bit brighter than what we're seeing here. And if we turn down the intensity of these, then the brown stops working properly. So it feels like you have to have it kind of at that setting right there. But I don't know if it's visible in the camera, but this is just too bright versus this. This is too dim. I don't think there's actually any way to fix that. That is just the decisions that were made on this decoding board on the side here. And there are really no adjustments on there other than the cathode drive or the RGB drive. And that is it. I feel that when this monitor was newer as well, the brightness control didn't need to be maxed out like it is right now. And because of that, the text is not very sharp. And when we turn this down, now this looks a lot dimmer. And it might be fine in the camera, but to my eyes, this is quite a bit too dim for, for really use in any kind of daylight environment. And the text is nice and sharp now, but it's just too dim. But when you turn it up like this, it's nice and bright now, but the text is now kind of blown out. So this CRT is unfortunately a little bit worn out. I mean, it's fine for just casual use, but I think this would kind of annoy me if this was my full-time monitor that I was using. But it's unfortunately just par for the course. This monitor was just well used and well, that's what we're getting. 
Now there are some other controls on here. Oh, we have a width control and that's just a potentiometer. Wow, cool. So we're in EGA mode and we can actually widen this up a little bit. I assume the one that's sitting right next to it probably affects the CGA mode specifically. So if we go to CGA and we do cross hatch, let me adjust the control that was right next to the one I was just adjusting. And I bet you this will control. Yep, that's the CGA width. Cool. I just wanted to show the controls that I was adjusting. So those two pots right there, the one that's closer to the CRT neck is EGA. And the one that's closer to the decoder board here is the one that's for CGA. And these are the four potentiometers for horizontal frequency and horizontal phase. Two of them are for CGA and two are for EGA. And that's what I was adjusting when I first turned on the machine to get the screen, you know, uh, looking good. Now I see one single control on the neck board. I'm gonna try to adjust that. I wanna see what that does. I'm gonna use this plastic tool here because it looks like it's high voltage. Uh, yep, it seems to be like a grid control of some kind. So it's actually dimming the image out a little bit. You can kind of see that there, how much dimmer that might look there. It's kind of like a sub brightness control. So if you turn it up, it makes the image brighter, but it's gonna also cause it to blow out more. If I turn this up too high, now the whole image is kind of washed out. And I can tell actually I have the red turned up too high because the black area here kind of got a pinkish color to it. So I'm gonna turn that down a little bit just to get rid of the pink in this. Maybe that actually helped a little bit, brighten up this dimmer part of the image. The EGA menu here and do the RGBI pattern six. Hmm. I'm not sure. I don't think this is any better. It's still a bit too contrasty for my liking. The bright parts here are too bright versus these. Now the voltage tripler, which I showed earlier, that thing has a focus control on it. So I'm just going to turn that. Now it's way out of focus. I'm going to just try to get the focus good over here. Yeah, it's just really hard to tell. Maybe if I switch to CGA mode, that'll help a little bit. Focus. There's actually a focus entry in here. Oh, it displays little dots. That's kind of cool. So let's uh, turn this here. Oh yeah, that, that works pretty well. So I'm just adjusting it where they are as clear and defined as possible. But obviously when I turn up the brightness to a, a better level, then they kind of bleed and disappear. I don't really see that these are individual dots unless I turn the brightness way down. That's what you kind of get when you have a worn out CRT, unfortunately, totally blown out. Yeah, if I turn this up, see the text is really not sharp now, but if we turn it down, better. Okay, so here's what's interesting is there's a screen control on the tripler that doesn't do anything. There's a knob there, but I'm turning it right now and nothing is happening at all. And I think it's because it's actually on the neck board. I'm gonna run Planet X3 in EGA mode because I find that it has a very nice looking splash screen here that uses dithering to essentially simulate 256 colors. Look how good that looks. Back in the day, you just didn't see a lot of stuff that was EGA that was dithered down from 256 colors. And if you're in the 640 by 200 mode, which is what we're in right here, it's the CGA type mode, but it's running at 640 by 200 and it's using the dithering of the 16 available colors to create this image that looks really, really quite good. And yeah, I can see the dots and stuff, but on this monitor, because it's kind of blown out a little bit, just because this thing is worn out, it actually looks pretty darn amazing. If we start the actual game, same technique is used here in the gameplay area to create more colors than you would normally see on EGA. And remember, this is just using the standard 16 colors. It is not using the extra color palette that's available to EGA because we're not running a 640 by 350 resolution. David Murray just used the same assets from the VGA game. That was 320 by 200, 256 colors, and then dithered them with EGA to look, well, pretty darn good. I think if you had a good image viewer that would take a 320 by 200, 256 color image and then dither it appropriately, you'd actually have something that looked really, really good. Now I have C-Show or CompuShow here, and this supports all these different modes. So for instance, if we do, this is the regular CGA color palette. Now there is some dithering, but because it's not using the 640 by 200 mode to do the dithering, I think it's still rendering. Uh, we're looking at just a little subset of the image here. It doesn't look nearly as good as it could. There we go, now we can scroll through the image. So you can see there, it's like a DJ table. It's not bad considering it's just those 16 colors, 
But unfortunately, if we pick 640 by 200, the same mode that was being used for the intro screen to Planet X3, it doesn't take advantage of the dithering. It just screws up the aspect ratio. Now it's all squished. You can see that there, it's just squished. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't use those extra pixels to do the dithering from the 256 colors down, uh, down to the 16 color mode. Now that was a GIF we were looking at. Let's take a look at this JPEG here and see if it behaves any differently. I'm gonna go right to six here. Now it's obviously gonna be way slower because this is a 286 that we're running this on. And I say it's too soon to see if it's dithering properly. You know what? I think the aspect ratio is actually okay here. And this is doing a much better job at the decoding and the dithering here. Interesting. Yeah, that's really not half bad. Now, what we also have available to us is 640 by 350 as 16 colors, and that does have the adjustable color palette. I don't know if it's going to take advantage of it, though, because it would need to have like a two-pass rendering where it decoded the JPEG, looked at the colors, analyzed what would be the best EGA color palette to use, and then changed the colors. But maybe after it's finished here, it'll, it'll switch. I don't think it will, though. Now, you know what? Looking at these colors, these seem more vibrant than we saw in the other mode. Yeah, look at this ring here. So decoding JPEGs with CompuShow 9 in EGA takes advantage of those extra colors. What happens if I push the green button? <laughs> we lose everything. Well, that I have to say is pretty impressive for a display, not this one, but EGA standard that came out in 1984. I think I have some color bars here. And this also does dithering and yeah, these colors look really vibrant here. I don't think we would have access to these if we were stuck with just the standard 16 colors on the CGA color palette. In fact, we can test that by just pressing six here. And yeah, look how much more muted these colors are. The yellow here is sad compared to the vibrant yellow we were getting on the EGA mode. And I have one more, which is a picture of me. <laughs> so let's see how this looks. Well, we can see here that skin tones are the Achilles heel of the color palette and the rendering method that Seashow uses at least. I feel that if it had zoomed in a little bit more, we'd have more pixels available for the dithering and then potentially wouldn't have all this banding we're seeing here. Still impressive though, compared to the 16 colors available in the CGA palette, especially at 320 by 200. So in this higher resolution mode, you know, from sitting further back, it looks pretty darn good. And I'm just running check it here and I'm using this to help adjust the colors. This is just CGA colors that we're looking at. And just trying to get things looking as good as possible here. And you know what? I think I can get it a bit better than I had it before. Cause yeah, that was how I had it before, but the brown is a little bit too hot there. I was also noticing that the dark gray and the light gray, there wasn't much of a difference between them, but turning this down creates that difference. Yeah, I'd say that that's a bit better. Now I have the game Iron Man on here and Iron Man is one of those games that actually can use the additional color palette, but in 320 by 240. But if you don't have a monitor that supports it, then what happens is you have weird looking colors. And the parameters are you can use game EGA 16 for the normal color palette or game EGA 64 to support the extra 64 color palette. But I am almost positive it's not gonna work properly. And it's not the VGA card, it's the monitor. Most monitors can only decode 16 colors in 320 by 200 mode, the CGA resolution. Some of them have a switch on them where you can bypass the color limitation where you can look at those extra intensity bits, but most monitors just auto select. And I'm positive that that's what's gonna happen here. So we do EGA 64 and we start this. And yeah, well, we're not getting the correct colors. So when it's running properly, you get proper skin tones. And uh, let's see, no sound, let's start the game. Yeah, you get much better skin tones in here. The colors are more vibrant and everything. It just, it looks a lot better. I've seen screenshots of it. And unfortunately, this monitor is just not supporting it. And you see here with the game running, when you're running in the 64 color mode, then the track is all brown, different shades of brown, because it's supposed to be dirt. And unfortunately in this mode where it thinks we have those extra colors, we're getting all these pinks and stuff like that. I think what happens in the 16 color mode, if I exit and run that, then what happens is it uses all brown, this brown, and it dithers it. So that way you don't get this kind of pink looking track. 
Okay, it's the next day. I actually shot the outro to the video on this monitor, but while I was editing the video, I was chatting with some friends about some of the final adjustments I'd like to make on this monitor, specifically moving the image up because it seems like it's down a little too far. And I sent them some photos of the inside of this monitor and they thought that I was actually working on an IBM 5154 monitor, the actual IBM EGA monitor and not this Samsung monitor. And they sent me over the SAMS service manual for the IBM monitor, as that's what they thought I was working on, and that would have some information on the adjustments. And I started looking at the schematics and I thought, well, this certainly looks really, really similar to the way this thing is laid out. And the funny thing is, I bet you there were people watching this video when I disassembled this thing and thought, hey, that looks kind of similar to the IBM 5154 on the inside. But I started looking at pictures of other people's 5154s on the inside, including the power supply, and I noticed it's freaking identical. And digging a little deeper revealed even more similarities. The controls on the back of the monitor on the 5154, identical. The controls for horizontal frequency and horizontal size in exactly the same spot on both this monitor and the IBM as well. And it goes further, the two's horizontal size controls are also in the exact same spot located right there as well. The arrangement over here with the tripler and the flyback transformer, also identical on both monitors. I mean, really, it's starting to look like this monitor and the IBM 5154 are the same. Now, needless to say, at this point, I was extremely shocked. I've never worked on a 5154 IBM monitor, so I wasn't really familiar with the way it looked on the inside, but all the pictures I could find of the 5154 and this basically confirmed that internally, these are the same monitor. And the final confirmation really was when you take a look at the badge on the IBM 5154, yeah, it says IBM all over it, but when you look at the FCC ID, it starts with the exact same digits as this monitor, which implies same exact manufacturer. That means that Samsung was the OEM manufacturer of the IBM 5154. And this monitor we have sitting right here on the bench is Samsung's version of that EGA monitor. What's so cool about that is there's service documentation available for the IBM 5154 that shows full schematics. And there isn't anything for this at all. And yet, we could just refer to the IBM documentation if we have to do any kind of repairs. How awesome is that? Now, besides the external case differences on these two monitors, internally, they're not exactly the same. The decoder board on this thing is not encased in shielding like it is on the IBM. But beyond that, you have this connection right here, which goes to that switch on the front panel, which disables the red and the blue color. So all you get is a green display. IBM chose not to implement that on their version of the monitor. Now, it is definitely these wires that go to that switch on the front, which disable the colors. And if you unplug this, even just one wire here, you end up with an all green screen on this all the time. So if you have one of these monitors and you are only getting green, definitely check to make sure that you have continuity here on these connections. What's cool about that, though, is it's possible to repurpose this switch by simply jumping between these two pins on here to disable that function altogether. So we always have color and repurposing this to do other things. So I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna put a little jumper link between the two connections for the green switch. This will just bypass it entirely. And the reason why I'm thinking of doing that is I want to try to modify this board so we can get the 64 color decoding in games like Iron Man. I know it's such a niche use case for that, but I'd rather have that button enable the 64 color mode all the time. And I think I have a lead on how this is possible. Okay, we're gonna do the classy thing here of recording the actual screen. And here's the SAMS for the 5154, the SAMS photo fact. You can find this online pretty easily. What I wanna show here is the input connection that comes from the TTL digital cable. So this is it right here. And it makes its way through a buffer IC, an LS244. And on the 5154, it goes into a TBP28L22. This is a 256 bit PROM chip, a programmable ROM. It has inputs on one side and outputs on the other side. And this is what is basically decoding the colors. Out of this comes signals that makes their way over to the analog processing circuitry. So we have green on the top here, blue, and then red. And each of these has two input signals. And that's basically the two bits of information for the 64 color mode. And there has to be a way for this chip right here to switch into 16 color decoding when it's in the CGA modes. Now, typically when you're looking at a schematic, everything that's going onto a chip on the left side are inputs and everything on the right side are outputs. And that makes a lot of sense here because all the outputs are going over here 
to the video circuitry, and on the input side, you have the video signals. You have RGB, plus you have those three other signals for the other intensity bits. Now, here's what doesn't make sense. On the input side of this chip, we have five volts going into it. We have ground on these pins, and that's it. We have stuff on the output side here going over to the video amplification circuitry, and then we have this one signal here that goes down to the vertical sync circuit. Well, what doesn't make sense here is that there needs to be a way for this chip to know whether it is receiving a CGA signal or an EGA signal. And on EGA monitors, the way that happens is the vertical sync polarity gets inverted when it's in EGA, and that's versus the CGA mode. That's how the monitor really knows to switch scan rates and everything and engage the EGA mode. When we look at the output of this 4077 here, there's a little junction there, it goes to pin four on this IC but it's on the output side and it doesn't really make sense. Why would this have anything on the output side going to a vertical sync circuit that actually drives the sync on the monitor? Well, it doesn't. Because after some searching, I found the pinout for this little IC here. It's not easy to find because it's just really old and hasn't been made since the 80s, but the 28L22 pin four, which was the output on schematic, is one of the inputs. A0, one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven. Those are the inputs to this chip. The O signals here are all the outputs and there are two chip enable lines. So the SAM schematic has a bit of an error here where it's showing pin four as an output when the reality is that's the input. And it makes sense that that must be the signal that tells this chip, hey, you need to disable 64 color mode and go into 16 color mode. Well, unfortunately, that's where we run into a little bit of a problem. Now, I've taken the screws out of this board so I can just get a better look at it. The Samsung design does not use the prompts. This actually uses all TTL logic and that HC4077. That chip's on here. But instead of that 2822 prom per Ramble ROM, they're just rep replicating it all with TTL logic. Maybe there was a rights issue with IBM and they didn't want to share the prom, or maybe it was just cheaper to do it this way. Obviously it works. But what I can see is this IC here is the 4077 that is the output of the vertical sync. And it's pin 10 on this that makes its way over to this IC right here. Now on the IBM board, so I looked at a picture of it, this is the prom, the 2822. But on this board, it's a 74LS157. And if we go to the data sheet of the 74LS157, which is what, this quad two input multiplexer, pin one, which is the pin on the output of that 4077, it goes into here. And we look at this and it says S pin, common select input. And if we scroll down to the truth table here, we can see that depending on whether this is high or low, it changes the functionality of this chip. It like it selects between two modes of operation almost. You can think of it that way. So this really does jive with the fact that this is probably selecting which of the modes is enabled, whether you're in the 64 color mode or the 16 color mode. Now, if we're gonna do this modification, what we need to figure out is which mode is which. So when this signal is low, are we in 16 color mode? Or when it's high, are we in 16 color mode? And then what we need to do is hook this switch up between the output of the 4077 and the input on pin one there, right? So in one position, there's actually a connection going through here. And that means that the monitor will just operate in automatic mode. But if we push on the switch to disable it, which breaks the connection here, what we need to do is install either a pull up resistor or a pull down resistor on the input to the 157 that will essentially hold it in the 64 color mode all the time. All right, I hooked up the oscilloscope between the connection between those two chips. Luckily, there's a little jumper link on the other side of the PCB, so I could just clip right onto there. And I think everything should be good to go to turn this on. Let me just make sure. Yep, okay, here we go. Turn on the monitor. And I have this set for one volt per division, and currently we're out around zero volts. And the monitor right now is in EGA mode. And notice we don't have the all green mode because the switch has been bypassed, right? I, I jumped over the links there, and the switch is just disconnected. All right, so here we are in vid test. I'm gonna run the mode switch thing here. And now we're in 200 line mode, 350 line mode. And you can see perfectly well that it goes high when it's in the 16 color CGA mode. And it goes low, a solid low, while it's in EGA mode. Let's just make sure that's the case by changing the time base on here to slow it way down. I just wanna see if there's anything going on now. There we go, we're on roll mode. And you can see it perfectly follows which mode you're in. That is really easy. We're not gonna have any issues forcing this monitor into 64 color mode now. So here's a little diagram of how this actually works. So the 4077 pin 10, which is the output, 
that goes to, well, it goes to some other stuff, which has to do with the synchronization circuitry on the monitor itself. But then it goes into a jumper link. There's a little jumper link. And on the other side of that, it goes into pin one on the 74LS157. And that is the signal that we're gonna cut and change over so we can force the monitor to always be in 64 color mode. So here's the modification I'm gonna make. I'm gonna remove the jumper link, and then I'm gonna add from pin one a 10K resistor down to ground. And what that does is when you push the switch, which will disconnect this chip's output from this, then this will force this chip into EGA mode all the time. When you push the switch in though, the high signal when you're in CGA mode will override this 10K resistor. You can see it's in high there, and that will allow the monitor to operate in automatic mode. All right, I'm just gonna do that modification and we'll see how it works <laughs> after the jump cut. Okay, actually, before I cut the wires here for the switch, what I did is I actually just installed the 10K resistor between pin one and ground, and I removed the jumper link that was going between the 4077 and uh, this, this chip here, the uh, 157. If this works, then the monitor should be in 64 color mode all the time. And all I need to do is hook the switch up between the two pins where the jumper link were, and then there we go. We have automatic and manual mode. Yes. So here we go. Let's turn this on and see what happens. We should have a good image either way. It should be switching mode still. Okay, looks good. Good, okay, nothing looks broken here. I think what we need to do is run Iron Man here with EGA 64 specified, and let's see what we get. Oh no, that didn't seem to work. We're still getting the wrong colors here. It could be that the EGA card I'm using here doesn't support this mode? Is that possible? Are you using a joystick? No. Let's just make sure this is messed up. Yeah, these aren't the right colors. I'm positive of that. Well, back in vid test here, let's run the RGBI mode here. Let's make sure we're getting... Oh, okay. We're stuck in the wrong mode here. We're stuck in CGA mode. Yeah, that's what's happening. So we're not getting the 64 color mode anymore. As you can see, we're missing all those extra colors on this screen. Okay, let me go fix that. All right, it looked like the 10K pull-down resistor was not strong enough and the input to the chip was around one volt. I put a 4.7K. Let's see if that made a difference here. No, it did not. All right, the problem was the pull-down resistor was only 10K. I tried 4.7K, that wasn't quite enough. Weirdly enough, it would make the red work, but the rest wouldn't work. So I tried a 1K and I think this may be working now, hopefully. Let's see. Yes, there we go. So we got three colors of red, three green, three blue, three white. So we have, at least on this test pattern, the correct pictures. Now, if we go and we display normal color bars, it looks totally fine. But I think if we go into check it here and we display normal CGA modes, the colors are gonna look wrong. Let's see here. Yeah, okay, not correct. We're losing the brown. We don't have the brown. We had dark yellow and that looks wrong too. And we can kind of tell here in this CGA screen, oh, the camera, let me fix the camera here. Okay, there we go. So we have brown instead of dark gray. Yeah, the colors don't look quite right. And that's because it's trying to decode the EGA colors with CGA mode and it just doesn't work. And if we go to the EGA colors there, it looks totally fine. So we're the 350 line mode, everything's working well. The text modes work properly because we're in 350 line mode. But now if we go into Iron Man, we do EGA 64. Ah, uh, yes, I, I think that's it. I think that was working now. The colors on the, the helmet there are a little more smoothly gradated, bright red here. We have better skin tones. Let's try to get to the race mode here. I gotta wait for these screens to go by. I think it's playing some music right now, which we can't hear. Oh yeah, look at this. So we have like a light brown and a darker brown, and those are the 64 color EGA colors freaking working. Sweet. And look at this better skin tone, sort of a pinky color, but it's better than the white that it normally shows. So this absolutely, positively is working properly now. Now to wire in that switch. Okay, so the switch is connected. I just cut the little ends off and added some pins onto the board where that jumper link were. As you can see, we're currently in the 64 color mode. And if we push the green button, <laughs> there we are in 16 color mode. So now this is an automatic when the button is out and when the button is in, it's always in 64 color mode. <laughs> that is pretty cool. All right, let's take a look on this screen, what it looks like when we push the button. Yep, there we go. Skin color goes away. This different uh, shades of yellow goes away. Now this screen, 
no real difference. And how about on this screen here? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, minor changes. It's so, like the stuff up here changes. And on this one here, obviously skin color changed. That is so awesome. Oh, here we go on the title screen. Yep, just the shading on the face and the hat changes as well. That's awesome. That's a major improvement for this monitor and makes it, well, one of the very few EGA monitors that has a forced 64 color mode. Freaking awesome. And as a reminder, this is the diagram here. So you remove the jumper link, you add the switch in there, and you add a 1K pull-up resistor between pin one and the 4077. You know, on the IBM version, it uses pin 428L22, that's the PROM. Same exact setup otherwise, so I have a feeling you've removed the jumper link, which is there on the IBM as well, and you do a similar setup. You won't have a switch on the front of the monitor, so you're gonna have to install one yourself. But, well, you can start with the 10K resistor to ground and see if that works. Um, I don't know why I needed a 1K on there. I checked to make sure pin one wasn't connected to anything at all, and it wasn't. It simply goes between the jumper link and that chip. But for whatever reason, this particular 157 that's on the, this monitor needed a 1K pull down. But the 28L22 might need less current, and a 10K or 4.7 might work fine as well. I think the 4077 here can drive enough current, though, to counteract this 1K while it's pulling up to 5 volts. Shouldn't be a problem. But there we go. That is the 64 color EGA mod <laughs> that you could do on your monitors. <laughs> Looks good. Now, I would be super curious to know, are there any other games out there that use this mode <laughs> besides the Iron Man game? Because if there are, I'd certainly like to try them. Okay, so from a geometry perspective, I'm pretty happy with this. I mean, it's sure it's a little curved over here. There's not much you can do about it, but I want to at least center the image in the vertical orientation. There's bigger gap here than there is down there. And while you can't expect perfection out of these monitors, I'd like something a little bit better than this. Now, when I was checking out the schematics for the 5154, there is a control for that. And I'm pretty sure that same control is on this monitor. And it's down there on the board. You see that circular black thing? That is a potentiometer there. And I'm pretty sure that 1K potentiometer, high current one probably, is what controls the position on the screen. And that's the same on the IBM. So I'm going to carefully get a tool into there. Try to adjust this. Okay, there we go. Yep, that's it. Moving it up right now, turning it counterclockwise. And that is far better. The gap is a lot more even now between the top and the bottom, which makes me <laughs> really happy. There are two little potentiometers that are positioned perpendicular to the PCB right next to that control. So you can kind of get to them from the back corner. I'm pretty sure those are either vertical linearity controls because they're not labeled or they're vertical hold controls. Either way, I'm happy with the linearity and I'm happy with the vertical holds. I don't need to fix any of those. That large potentiometer centered this picture on the screen, which is pretty much exactly what I wanted to do. And there's just one last thing that I want to talk about on the decoding board. Now I noticed on the IBM, the decoding board here is labeled. So all the pots are actually labeled properly. And then I looked at the schematics to see what these various pots are doing. And I realized that I had it wrong. So these three that are all in a row here are actually the red cut, green cut, and blue cut. And then the two that are down here and here, which are missing on the red one because it has a fixed value resistor right there. These are what control the balance between the dark and the light intensity. Essentially, the way they're described on the schematic is green drive MSB and LSB, most significant bit and least significant bit. I think the bottom one is the least significant bit on both of these, and that, and that adjusts the amount of drive on the green and the blue channel on the darker colors. And then the top one here adjusts the amount of drive on the lighter colors. So I went through and I adjusted all these again because I had fiddled with this, which made the kind of dark gray color a little pink on this monitor, so I fixed that and I've twiddled with these, and now I'm much more happy with the balance between the light and the dark colors when looking at the digital signal. There's no real DAC per se on this board, digital to analog converter. It's essentially these parts here which are controlling that. And then the outputs of these go into these parts here, and that actually drives the cathodes. So if you're gonna try to modify this monitor to display analog RGB, you'd probably need to create a little board with some transistors as a switch, where you would take the output of all of these stages here, disconnect them, and then you'd feed in the analog um, RGB signal, but you'd need to also put potentiometers on that to adjust the, essentially the bias, which is basically the offset of the entire analog waveform, and then the drive, which is the amplitude. So bias adjusts the actual entire waveform up and down. 
and then the drive is how much amplitude there is. And it might need to be inverted and stuff like that. So quite a bit of reverse engineering would need to be done. But theoretically, you could do analog input on this as well. You could set it for CGA mode. That would be the frequency for like an Amiga and then feed the analog circuits in. But you have to recreate those signals. And based on the service data I saw, the output of these analog stages here, where all these uh, potentiometers are, is about one volt peak to peak or 0.7 volts peak to peak. So it pretty much matches exactly what regular analog RGB is. But I have a feeling you just need to do some tweaks to the levels and stuff to compensate for the CRT aging, because these controls are essentially doing that exact thing. And if we bypass all of this stuff, well, there's nothing on the neck board on this particular CRT, which is right here. There are no controls on that. All the controls are on that stage right there. And now it's out of focus. There we go. Now it's in focus. So there we have it. The Samsung CD1452M. Basically the same exact monitor as the IBM 5154, the much loved and searched for EGA monitor. But in a way, this one's better because it's a simple mod to enable the 64 color low resolution mode without even having to cut or do anything to the external case and easily reversible if I wanted to put this thing back to stock. So if you happen to find one of these monitors around or one of the other OEM versions of this monitor, like, the, like that Tandy monitor I showed earlier in the video, thank you Sark for sending those pictures, know that it is just an IBM 5154 inside. So look for the service documentation for that monitor if you need to do any repairs on this. And I was really surprised when I found out that Samsung was just the OEM manufacturer of IBM's monitor and this was their version of the monitor. I had no idea this was the case and I have no idea if anyone was ever aware that Samsung actually sold here in North America their version of the 5154 and that Tandy version as well. If you know of other versions of this monitor that were OEM'd under different brands, definitely let me know or put a comment down below, send some pictures if you can. And I'm excited to know that the video quality on this thing, even though it's a little bit worn out, should be just as good as the IBM monitor since, well, Samsung designed the IBM one and it's all the same circuitry, except just for that more simple color decoding stuff that's happening on here versus the prom. I just, I'm curious why they changed that, but whatever, it works. And I love this mod. I really, really love this mod. So, okay, I think I've gone on for long enough about this thing. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't, comment down below. Patrons, thanks so much. Names over here, all the usual YouTube junk. And I think that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.